We are in outer space and seeing the Earth as it looks from a distance of 40,000 miles. Man has entered a new era, the beginnings of travel through space. In order to travel from the Earth to other members of the solar system and return, we must know with great precision the location of our destination and the course we must follow. Wherever we wish to go, through space or from place to place on the Earth, we must solve these problems. Where are we and where do we wish to go? On the Earth, any position is defined by two measurements, longitude, our angular distance east or west of Greenwich, England, and latitude, our angular distance north or south of the equator. High in the sky or far out in the ocean, we do not have mountains, lighthouses, or other conventional landmarks to tell location. Instead, we must relate our position to objects in the sky. To navigate using celestial objects, an observer measures the angular distance of a celestial body above the horizon, its altitude, and notes the precise instant of the observation. At that instant, the object observed is directly over some point on the Earth. The navigator making the observation is somewhere on a circle around this point. To establish his position on this circle, a second body must be observed, and a different circle will result. The circles will intersect, and the navigator's position is the point of intersection. The apparent positions in the sky of the celestial bodies is continually changing, so it is important to be able to predict where everything will appear in the sky at various times. This information must be readily available to all who need it. Producing, publishing, and distributing this data is the responsibility of the United States Naval Observatory located in Washington, D.C. The observatory was established in 1841 to determine precise star positions and accurate time for the purpose of aiding navigation. The celestial data obtained at the observatory must be refined and reduced into a form more convenient for use by navigators, surveyors, astronomers, and other scientists. The production of these tables with the accuracy needed in today's modern world involves many separate steps. Preliminary data must be punched onto cards and then carefully checked to eliminate all possible errors. An electronic computer is used to perform the necessary calculations and a data tape is prepared for direct translation by an automatic electronic printer, the Linotron. The Linotron then produces the printer's copy pages to be published in book form and distributed throughout the world. The American Ephemeris, of which over 10,000 copies are produced annually, contains the predicted positions of the sun, moon, and planets for every day of the year, the positions of the brightest stars, and other fundamental astronomical data. More than 60,000 copies of other smaller volumes, such as the Nautical Almanac and the Air Almanac, which contain only the data needed by navigators, are published more frequently, as well as tables and predictions for special uses. It is the painstaking accumulation of this data that comprises the work of the rest of the Naval Observatory. The basic instrument used for determining fundamental positions of the sun, moon, planets, and stars is a special type of telescope called a transit circle. Its name comes from its function, to measure the transit or crossing of celestial objects past its meridian. The Naval Observatory operates the only such telescope in use in the United States. It is precisely constructed to swing from north to south along its meridian. In this polar view of the Earth, observe this meridian extending into space. As the Earth rotates on its axis, stars will appear to cross overhead in the opposite direction of the Earth's rotation and transit the meridian. Each time a particular star transits the meridian, the Earth has made one complete rotation. This then defines a unit of time, the sidereal day. Every star transits the meridian once each sidereal day. And this time of transit 
together with its angular distance north or south of the celestial equator, the extension into space of the Earth's equator, defines the star's position in the sky. A basic list of the observed positions of the brightest stars does in fact define the coordinate system, a celestial grid to which all other positions in the sky are referred. Using a preliminary position computed in advance, the astronomer points the telescope at the proper angle to observe a particular star's transit. As the star enters the telescope's field of view, the astronomer centers it between traveling wires and carefully tracks it as it transits the meridian. At set intervals, the star's position in the field of view is read out electronically and stored in a computer for later analysis. Atmospheric conditions, such as temperature and pressure which affect the observed position of the star, are also automatically recorded. At the end of the observation, photographs are taken of a finely calibrated gold circle attached to the telescope. Later, the photographs are measured to determine precisely the pointing of the telescope. These observations, thousands of which are made each year by Naval Observatory astronomers, when combined with earlier observations, will result in an increasingly more precise knowledge of the positions and motions of the stars. Near the Andes Mountains in western Argentina, in order to meet the more stringent needs of modern navigation and space exploration, the Naval Observatory operates another observing site. Here, a second transit circle is used to obtain improved positions and motions of the southern stars. At the Washington Observatory, these spacious lawns, the shrubbery, the gracious big trees, are necessary to help isolate and protect the observatory's instruments from ground level atmospheric disturbances. High quality observations can be maintained only where the environment of the instruments remains stable against sudden change. As we have seen, the measurement of star positions and the determination of time are closely related. Within this master clock room are displays of correct time which it is the responsibility of the Naval Observatory to provide. But the correct time means different things to different people. And so the time service of the Naval Observatory determines three different kinds of time. The first kind is our standard time, or mean solar time. Standard time is based on the rotation of the Earth on its axis and is the time used in everyday life. This telescope, called a photographic zenith tube, is used to determine solar time. A similar telescope is at the Time Service substation in Richmond, Florida. The photographic zenith tube, a specialized form of the transit telescope, is mounted in a fixed vertical position in order to photograph the narrow band of stars that passes directly overhead. By reversing the camera, a star is photographed several times during its transit of the meridian. Since the star's position is known, the mean solar time it was on the meridian may be computed. Celestial bodies, such as the planets in our solar system, follow their paths according to natural laws. And these laws enable us to predict their motions and positions for any time in the future. The rotation of the Earth is not absolutely uniform. And although solar time, which is based on this rotation, is accurate enough for everyday use, Astronomers need another, more uniform time scale for long-range predictions. This second kind of time, ephemeris time, is defined by the annual orbital motion of the Earth around the Sun and is independent of the Earth's rotation. In actual practice, because our satellite, the Moon, accompanies us in this orbit and is readily observable and completes its orbit around the Earth in a short period of time, we use the motion of the Moon against the background of the stars to determine ephemeris time. Both the standard time displayed by these clocks, as well as ephemeris time, depend upon careful astronomical observations for their continued precision and calibration. We have long sought a precise time scale which can be independently determined and maintained. We have it in atomic time. This atomic clock contains cesium atoms placed in an oscillating magnetic field. The atoms radiate at a constant frequency, providing a very uniform and independent means of timekeeping. By using several atomic clocks together, 
This third kind of time, provided by the Naval Observatory, can be maintained with an accuracy of one ten millionth of a second. Atomic time provides the needed independent calibration for standard time and ephemeris time, as well as serving the most critical needs of science and technology. It is also the responsibility of the Naval Observatory to distribute accurate time and to monitor the accuracy of its application. There are more than 1,000 users of Naval Observatory time accurate to one thousandth of a second, and several hundred users requiring an accuracy of one millionth of a second. The Loran Sea Navigational Network requires Naval Observatory time, as does the satellite navigational system of the Navy. In fact, Naval Observatory time is used by scientific installations all over the world, requiring accurate time or time intervals. For those applications requiring the highest precision, the Naval Observatory must distribute time with these portable atomic clocks. After being calibrated in Washington, they are hand carried to other facilities. In this manner, a time system accurate to a millionth of a second is maintained throughout the world. Naval Observatory astronomers not only carry out and distribute precise measurements, they also perform advanced research in many areas of astronomy to gain a clearer insight into the nature of our physical surroundings. Such research takes many different forms, such as the application of the latest electronic techniques to the problem of determining positions with an accuracy never before attainable. With this 15-inch astrographic telescope in Washington, Photographic studies of faint asteroids are carried out. Because of their low mass, the study of these asteroids is providing new insight into the theories of motion of the planets. And taking advantage of modern computers, Naval Observatory astronomers have been able to calculate improved values for the physical properties of our solar system. The largest telescope of the observatory in Washington is this 26-inch refractor. It is being used for both visual and photographic studies of double stars. Two stars revolving around each other are photographed or observed visually, and their positions relative to each other are measured. These measurements, accumulated over many years, enable astronomers to determine the masses of the stars, as well as the statistical properties of binary stars in general. This, in turn, has an important relationship to the theories of the formation of galaxies. Within this dome is a special kind of camera called the dual-rate moon camera, devised by Naval Observatory astronomers as a part of an international effort to improve the precision with which ephemeris time is determined. Mounted on an 8-inch telescope, the camera contains a filter to reduce the brightness of the moon so that moon and stars may be photographed together. The filter rotates to balance the moon's motion and hold it fixed during photography. The moon's photograph position, together with the solar time of the observation, may then be compared to the position predicted using ephemeris time. In the mountains of northern Arizona is another installation of the U.S. Naval Observatory. This is the Flagstaff Station. Here is located the largest of the observatory's telescopes, the uniquely constructed 61-inch astrometric reflector, designed to provide photographs free from the distortions common in other telescopes. It is used primarily in a long-range program of measuring the distances of the nearby stars. To measure the distance to a star, astronomers must use the motion of the Earth around the Sun. As the Earth revolves in its orbit around the Sun, and we look out toward a nearby star, it will appear to be at a certain place in the sky relative to stars further away. Six months later, when the Earth has moved to the other side of the Sun, the same nearby star will appear in a slightly different direction. One half of the small angle through which the star appears to have moved is called its parallax. Since we know the distance from the Earth to the Sun, as well as the angle between the Earth, Sun, and star, measuring the parallax allows us to solve the triangle for the distance from the Sun to the star. These parallax observations are made with a 61-inch telescope at six-month intervals. 
The photographs are then measured with this automatic measuring engine to determine the parallaxes. On the photographs, the nearby star appears to shift only a few thousandths of a millimeter. Virtually all of our factual knowledge concerning the stars is dependent upon these accurate distance determinations. A 40-inch telescope, as well as the 61-inch telescope, is used in programs of measuring the apparent brightness and colors of the stars. These data, when combined with the stellar distances, tell the astronomer the luminosities and surface temperatures of the stars. And from this, we are able to deduce possible means by which stars generate their energy. A new observational technique, electronography, is also being explored by Naval Observatory astronomers. The electronographic camera, developed at Flagstaff, receives light from the telescope, changes the light to a stream of electrons, and focuses the electrons on special film. Operating with a film cooled to a temperature of 310 degrees below zero, and in a vacuum equal to that of outer space, the electronographic camera gives the astronomer photographic images which have a 30-fold increase in efficiency and information over conventional photography. In effect, this makes the 61-inch telescope the equal of one over 300 inches in diameter, larger than any in existence. Continuing with research such as this will keep the United States Naval Observatory in the forefront of astronomical advances while meeting and serving the increasingly complex demands of timing and navigation on the earth and in the air and under the surface of the sea. Man has looked to the stars from his very beginnings as omens of the future. As distant, apparently unmoving beacons, they have provided him with the means of finding his position on his planet Earth. Now, the stars beckon for him to take a closer look at his universe, to voyage beyond the Earth. On this threshold of a new era of great voyages of discovery, the work of the United States Naval Observatory in providing accurate time and precise celestial positions has never been more important.